today on Hack 5, we've got Arduino Cylons, SSH tunneling on Android, and Linux video editing. Who'd have thought? All that and more this time on Hack 5. This episode of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello, welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. And I'm Shannon Morris. It's your weekly dose of techno lust. Welcome, friends and family members. We have Cylons coming. And we then do. we're going to secure your Android phone using some root magic with SSH tunnels. It's going to be very exciting. But first... I'm taking over the warehouse. Are you really? With my Cylon. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> I knew that this day would happen. In fact, Evil Server, I don't know if you know, Cameo, he's been kind of chilling on the B set. Just over there, just hanging but out. But with that said, He keeps on giving me the stink eye. Last jerk. week, I made a huge faux pas in that what? I said that there was no good video editors for Linux, right? Oh. I've tried. And then the entirety of the internet actually told you uh, that you were Thank wrong. you, internet. Because it has been a while since I tried all of them, but I do remember right before going on the first Hack Across America just being like, this is abysmal! And it kind of was then, but mm -hmm. a lot has changed in the last four years, and actually, uh, okay, so I must say, OpenShot, cute, doesn't really support all the file formats I need, really kind of, I, I don't know, just feels like so watered down. I think that it's a good alternative to say Windows Movie Maker, but not to Premiere, perhaps. Um, Pativi? Uh, also, same kind of idea, lack of development. Mm. Uh, however, everyone, everyone mentioned Kden Live with a big capital Kden K because it's for KDE. Oh. I'm running GNOME, but it still works just great. And it is actually the first video editor for Linux I've ever seen that's, like, I would say full featured. Really? And it feels just so natural. Like, here I am scrubbing through the timeline, I got a little drone footage here, and then I make my cut, and then. I make my next cut, and then like we can see the Doge here that I saw on the quadcopter, and you know, I mean, aside from setting a couple of keyboard shortcuts, um, there's a lot of awesome niceties that even Premiere doesn't have. Like Paul, check this out, right? Hot corner, top left, drag it in. I got my fade. Oh, cool! Look at that. Yeah, <laughs> Paul's just freaking out now. I can do the same thing with the audio. I can do it with like effects. If I do from the bottom up, there's. Uh, there's like um, different transitions, and so now I've got a transition here, and I can put it between there, and you know, it's a dissolve, but I can like make it multiply or oh any God, of those. Oh God, you can make it's, terrible effects. Yeah, it's like doing your first PowerPoint. It's gonna oh. be fantastic. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> I, I'm gonna try this. I, I think between this and uh, Krita and maybe Inkscape, I'm, go I'm crossing my fingers here, but I'm thinking since I am, you know, I'm, I'm only taking this machine. Yeah. Um, I gave up on the whole idea of just bringing the Chromebook. <laughs> it's just, no. No. <laughs> no, you just can't with an arm. You can't do what you do No, nah, just, just I need to be able to do the creative stuff and not mm -hmm. through the cloud either. Ha ah, ha, funnily enough. Anyway, <laughs> point being, I, I, I love the uh, comment on last week's episode urging Adobe not to port Creative Cloud over to Linux because it would just get a bunch of people like me who are just so used to their, you know, their tools at their disposal to just continue using those. And actually, it turns out this is not half bad. So I'm going to dive in. I'm going to learn a lot more about it. And so I hope that the videos that you see coming from Hacker Crop Europe will have been done through Kden Live, because at the very least, it does support all the file formats I've thrown at it. So no showstoppers so far. <laughs> Well, that's good. Yes. Well, I didn't have any problems building this little <laughs> uh, monstrosity. <laughs> mm, mm, I feel like it needs like a scar going across it. <laughs> <laughs> right. A scar on the side, maybe some uh, Cylon sound effects coming out of it. Oh, mm. like that one. Mm. There we go. Ooh. Uh, okay. Tell me, so last time we spoke about okay, your so, Arduino LED stuff, you yeah. were making push buttons do fading. Yeah, I was I was doing fading, so that was really easy, and I was doing it interactive, so you can press a button and it'll fade from you know zero to two fifty five, which is pretty normal. But I was only using one LED, so I wanted to grow off of that and be able to put multiple LEDs on one breadboard and try to figure out how to do that and make the code work. Um, for all of them to build it into a Cylon. Yes. <laughs> or a Knight Rider, depending on you know, which TV show is No, TV it's definitely a Cylon. Well, they were both written by the same person, so. Oh, that explains the, really? Yep. For real? Yeah, uh, yeah. You learn something new Changing every day. Something. If you learned one thing from Hack 5 this week, that was it. Yep, that was it. <laughs> so I stuck it inside of a toaster, but I might as well just go ahead and take it out of here so you can actually see what's going on here. I have a breadboard, of course. And then I have multiple LEDs on the front, and all of those are going to be lighting up. 
I have 220K, there we go, 220K ohm resistors and a bunch of white wires that are going from uh, the line items for each of the LEDs down to the pin numbers that are going to be on the Arduino Uno. I also have this green ground wire going from ground or negative on the breadboard over to ground on my Arduino Uno. And then I have this weird thing down here. Yeah, what's up with the potentiometer? So this is called a potentiometer. So it looks kind of weird, but if you if you take off a plastic dial off the front of like a volume thing on your radio mm -hmm. or on like an old TV or something like that, this turnstile will usually change the volume. And in my case, it changes the speed of the LED lights. So if I turn it down low, they go really, really slow. And then I turn it up all the way high. They go faster and faster and faster. And eventually they just all light up about medium. I don't mm -hmm. know if you can see that very well. Yeah, you can see it. So I'll turn it back to about Cylon speed. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So do you want to take a look at the code? Yeah, I would. In fact, I, I can only imagine already that you've got a loop that's basically enumerating through, what is this, pins 11 through, or no, it's pins 2 through, through 11. 12. Okay. 2 through 12. And then um, they go from... Two all the way up to twelve, and so then they're they fading. do. Yeah, th well, they're not fading, but they're doing a loop from uh, brightening one after the other, okay. and they go all the way up to twelve, and then I do the same loop but backwards. That would be the next step, I guess. Is since these are just like, like a fade. on and off, you yeah. could do like nice, like f like have it leave a trail. Yeah. Huh? Like, uh, <laughs> like what is it? Mouse, I think I could uh, do that pretty mouse easily. Mouse trails. Don't turn those on. So I'll put the link in the show notes to where I found an example of this code, and then I'll also post a picture, a close-up of my actual build, so you can see exactly where I put all my pins and all my LEDs and everything. That's kind of the so brilliant the stuff thing. about Arduino, is that, I mean, it's close enough to see that you're learning C. And to get started, you don't have to read circuit diagrams, especially when you're no, working you with don't. a breadboard, which... I think is funny enough that you just put a breadboard in a toaster. Unfortunately, like all the examples of Cylon code that I found online, they all had um, just schematics. They didn't have any really good pictures of their own breadboard, mm -hmm. so I kind of had to figure this out on my own. But you know, I I, I used a lot of what I've learned already to build this myself, mm -hmm. and then I found an awesome example code, and I built on top of that too. Let's take a look at the code. All right, so first off, up here, we are explaining exactly what each thing is going to be called. So start uh, starting off at the top, we have an int called LED pins, and this is an array from 2 all the way up to 12. So this is just naming off each of the pins that our LEDs are going to be connected to. The pin count is going to be 11. Oh, I see where that's important. Yeah, pin count is 11. And then the timer is going to be 10. So that means that there's a 10 millisecond delay. But the between timer on and off. is what's going to become a variable through the potentiometer, and yeah. the pin count is what's going to say where to light up the LEDs plus and minus one. There you go. Okay, <laughs> already figured it out. Okay, so first off over here, we have this little for loop that we're getting set up. This puts all the LEDs into an, L uh, into an array called uh, LED pins, this pin, and that's going to be our output. And it starts from 2 all the way up to 12. So this pin equals 0 and then plus plus each one. So it'll look at 0, it won't find anything. Then it goes up to 1, goes up to 2, all the way up to 12. Mm -hmm. Scrolling down a li little bit, this is our first loop. So we have two loops. The first one is increasing, and then the second loop is decreasing. So this first loop is going to be increasing from 2 all the way up to 12. So we start off with this for loop. Uh, we start off this pin equals 0, so the, this is setting this pin to 0. And then it'll go up and in a plus a count. Pin plus plus, so the pin equals pin plus 1. So here's our timer. Mm -hmm. So this analog read A0. This A0 is because I have ah, one of my potentiometer pins. pins plugged into A0, which is a pin on the Arduino Uno. Now that pin goes into the center, and that is the one that changes the volume or changes the LED speed whenever you turn the wheel on there. So it's exactly what you would find on a volume nozzle on yeah. like any it's, it's radius a, uh, or stuff. It's basically a resistor that's variable. It is. So so yeah, a potentiometer, they explain it as a three terminal resistor that creates a adjustable voltage divider that you can turn with your fingers. And you can use these on volume controls, you can use them for LEDs, radios, etc. Um, it's used to vary the speed of the lighting of the LEDs. And a voltage divider will take the power that's being input into it and divide it into a fraction that is less. So in this case I'm dividing by two. Surprise! So the speed, it all depends on that A0 potentiometer divided by two and that's how you get your delay. And next up we go down here. We're going to tell the current pin to be on and then we tell the next pin, so plus one, to be on and then yep, plus and then two to be on. 
Oh, I see. So it's always itself plus two ahead of it. I, yeah, I figured yeah. that it would be itself plus one, uh, one behind it, one ahead of it. But either way, you get be, three yeah. LEDs. So if you took that out, you would just have one LED going just back one. and forth. Yeah. Or if so, you added So yeah, I could easily plus... just delete both of those lines, yeah. and then I would just have one pin going back and forth, which that can be cool too, but I wanted it to look like a Cylon. Okay. <laughs> okay, so next up down here, we have the division by two that reads the potentiometer's value to get your delay. Ah, and this is where we set the timer based on what the potentiometer is saying. Right, and of course we don't, have, we don't want them to stay on, the LED, so we have to turn them off too. So down here we have low, which is off, for pin one, and then plus one, so pin two, plus two, so pin three. So that turns each of them off. And then down below that, we have our second for loop, and this is going to do the so same thing. So it's just identical, but going one. minus instead yeah, of plus. Yeah, minus one. So this will start at 12, and then it goes down all the way to number two, LED pin number two, and that'll just turn them all on and then off all the way down. That is Decreasing. so rad. Really, really cool. The code is a little bit more confusing, but once you figure out how to do it increasing, it's really easy to do it decreasing too. Right. But this is, awesome. This is rad. I also I would put love, this on my GitHub. So I would love to see this coupled with what you were doing last week with making them fade. And we should yeah. probably also point out, and there was a lot of great comments about how I made a faux pas saying that it's varying the voltage. Obviously, it's not varying the voltage. It's an LED set to whatever it is, 3.7 volts or whatever mm -hmm. have you. It's varying the... But there's some really good tutorials that we will link to because it is beyond the Very scope of brightness. what I can explain right now. But it's <laughs> essentially, it's like flickering it on and on off really fast. Ah, so interesting. that's how the LED fading works. So fast that you can't see it. Essentially, we got a really great uh, email with a video of, uh, from a um, student that did a project yeah, on just this. It was really fantastic. Really cool. So we'll send you guys some links on that kind of stuff and then bring this back up when it's uh, more relative to the segment. But I, I just thought that that was kind of cool. And then that kind of even fun. brings up the whole difference between, and say, our analog pins here and our digital ones. Yes, so that was interesting too. I was like, why can't I just plug them into the analog side? But mm. it totally makes sense once you actually plug in some LEDs. Also, if you screw up and put one of the wires into the wrong line, so if it's not lined up with one of your LEDs, for example, if I took one of these white wires out right now, I'm not going to do that since it's on, but it just ended up making one of my LEDs turn on and it wouldn't turn off. And I was like, why is it doing that? So I had to change my wire over to light up correctly. Standard troubleshooting. Like, oh, yay, troubleshooting. Fun. Yay. <laughs> Well, let us know what you guys think. Of course, you can find Shannon's code up on her GitHub, and yep. you'll find the links to all of the other resources where you can learn more about this stuff in the description, the show notes, whatever have you. Can we and mod the toaster? We are looking, yeah. <laughs> if you've got some ideas for some toaster mods, leave them in the comments or shoot <laughs> us an email, feedback at hack5.org. With that, we're going to take a quick break, and when we get back with a rooted Android phone, we're going to secure all of your internet connections. Ooh. With SSH tunnels. <laughs> It doesn't matter if you've got root access or you're a user or your essay or guest. When you have that killer idea, you need to snag yourself a domain name and web hosting fast and get this. You can do that over at domain.com. They've got a quick domain discovery system, an easy checkout process. All it really means is you're going to have your domain name, your website up and running in no time. I love the guys over at domain.com, mainly because they're affordable, reliable, and easy to use, but mostly because they are a huge like fun place to do business. They're awesome on social media. You can tweet them at domain.com and see what I'm talking about and why it just makes it like a great place to hang out and do business. And the guys over at domain.com, they're so cool. They want to hook you guys up. They're huge fans of Hack5. So they've got this coupon code, H-A-K-5, that you can use at checkout and it gets you an extra 15% off. So when you think domain names, think domain.com. It is time for the trivia question of the week. Last week's trivia question was, what science fiction writer wrote the three laws of robotics? And the answer is Isaac Asimov. Now this week's trivia question is, to whom was the first patent for a technical invention awarded? You can answer that at hack5.org slash trivia for your chance to win some awesome Hack 5 goodies. Good luck. So last week we talked about SSH tunneling with your Android phone without using root and it was, I'm not going to lie, a little convoluted. You have to use ConnectBot or some other similar uh, SSH tunneling program that will allow you to do a dynamic SOX proxy just like you would with the TAC-D option on your Linux computer. And then, of course, you just have to use any application that supports SOX proxies and unfortunately on Android that's not really everything. And it's also kind of a hassle because you have to configure it every time. So just for web browsing without root 
it's still pretty good as far as, you know, you can just fire up Firefox and, you know, use that as your secure browser. And we all know that we've done it at some point in time, had like the insecure browser and the secure browser, and forget that. That's not the way to do it. The way to do it properly is obviously to root your device because that's what you're going to need in order to play around with IP tables because once you've got that, then you can use this awesome program here called SSH Tunnel. Now, SSH Tunnel is an Android app that makes it really easy to just like it says on the tin, set up SSH tunnels. And what's so important about this one is that it's actually going to allow you to set it up as a global SSH tunnel for all of your applications or even just select applications on your phone. And also it's really user intuitive. Like, you know, you can set it to auto start up and auto reconnect and you kind of, one of those set and forget kind of things. So let's dive right in. Um, when you pop up the application, it pretty much just brings you right into settings because you don't need a whole big GUI with a bunch of stuff when really it's a service is either on or it's off. So to set it up, uh, we will notice that uh, we have a couple of different profiles. I'm going to use the default profile, but it is nice to know that you can add different SSH servers, for instance, here. And then, of course, the first thing is going to need to know the IP address of our host. And in this case, I'm going to use that throwaway VPS once more at 162.220.160. Okay, great. Uh, the port is going to be 22, that's your default. Uh, now we just set up our username. So in this case, uh, I'm not using root, I'm using DK, because it's a short username and it's a regular user account. I know, I know, you really shouldn't use your root account for that kind of stuff, it is a throwaway server. Uh, now, I will mention that as far as the password is concerned here, you can go ahead and set your passphrase or you can actually um, set up keys, SSH keys. Now, in order to do this, you will have to set up your SSH key pair, your public and private key, on another machine, right? And then, of course, you have to transfer over the key to the, you know, dot, it's in dot slash SSH slash authorized underscore keys, just like you normally would on any other SSH tunnel that you would do on, say, a desktop, whether it's Windows, Mac, or Linux. However, you then have to take that private key and transfer it over to your phone. If you do that, you'll find under the, uh, the big menu thingy over here that you can go into uh, Key File Manager, and it's actually going to bring up a file manager where you can then find on, say, your SD card or wherever you've stored it on your phone, that private key. Now, you can just go ahead and it depends on, you know, if you have a private key that records a password or not, um, you can leave that password field blank. I I kind of prefer not to do this just in case I do lose my phone. I don't want my private key in the wild. I mean, granted, you could, you know, as soon as you notice that you've lost your phone, go in and, and revoke that key, and that's good. But if your phone is your only connection to the internet when you're traveling, then it could be problematic. So for the moment, I'm just going to leave it with password authentication. And I should also mention that this is only on the server side. So if you want to do, you know, only um, key-based authentication, you have to set that up in your SSH uh, daemon configuration on your, you know, whatever, it's, whatever it is. If it's a you know, computer in the basement of your house or you know, a VPS up in the cloud, either way, you just need to set that on the server side if you want to make it strict so it only uses that. So that's the only like, difficult part. And now, honestly, it's not difficult if you're just going to use password, which is what I'm going to do. So I'm going to go ahead and give it my lame password. There we go. And now we're going to uh, we're going to check the box for use Sox proxy. There we go. That's going to make local port 1984. <laughs> nice little homage there. Uh, cute, cute. Uh, anything over 1024, obviously. I guess it really doesn't matter considering your root, but probably better if you stay over 1024. So we'll use uh, the Sox proxy. We'll scroll down here and check the box for auto reconnect. I'm not going to set the auto connect feature. I'll, I'll want to manage that. Uh, myself, we're also going to check the box here for global proxy. Now what this is going to do, and this is what requires root, it's going to use IP tables rules to ensure that all of the traffic that is destined to the internet, whether it's through Wi-Fi or your cellular pro provider, all of those applications, when they connect to the internet, they're going to connect through port 1984 locally, which is then going to go through that SSH tunnel. Uh, that's very important. This means that you're not going to have stuff leaking out from other applications, and that is generally a good thing. Now, if you don't want everything to go through this, you can uncheck that 
uh, global proxy box and you can actually hit this individual proxy button. And what this will do is show you a list of your applications and I can check the box. I want browser to go through it and I want the, let's see, I don't really have many applications on here. I want Gmail to go through it and you know, if you have whatever, I really don't have any apps on this. It's pretty fresh cyanogen mod phone, but um, you can choose on an application basis if you want them to go through that proxy, which is kind of cool. But I think that the real power really is having the global proxy. So I'm gonna go ahead and check that. And of course, we want to ensure that all DNS uh, queries go through our proxy. Otherwise, again, we're leaking information, not necessarily of what the contents of our message are, but where our messages are going. So in this case, we will enable DNS proxy. So that means every time it resolves a name, whether it's you know uh, foobar.com or uh, zombo, Com or Zombo.com, which is the best website on the internet, uh, that's not going to go like out in the wild. That's going to go through the SSH tunnel, and that's good stuff. So with all of that, we're going to go ahead and uh, I guess we should, you know, uh, let's check this box here for tunneling. We're going to get asked if we want to allow to use root. I'm going to say uh, I'm going to say remember this choice for 10 minutes and hit allow. First time you do this, it will pop up a warning uh, and saying, hey, is this the uh, key fingerprint you're expecting? Make sure that is, of course, the key fingerprint for your server so you're not getting man in the middle. And if it all looks good, hit yes and you're golden. It's going to remember that. If your key fingerprint changes, well, then something's wrong and you're going to get a warning. Uh, so with that, we can now test to see that all of our traffic is going through here. If I say pop up browser, and let's see here, I'm going to, yeah, I Google what is my IP, and it comes back as the same IP address that we had entered in before, that uh, 162.220.168.217. We can also say go to ipchicken.com. That's always a fun one. It's got a cute chicken on it. And there we go. And the chicken tells us that it is that IP. If we were to uncheck this proxy and do it again without that, it would come up saying our regular public IP, which in this case would be whatever I have through my cell modem. So I'll go ahead and go back to SSH tunnel and uncheck that. So now we're disconnected and I'll come back to IP chicken. And instead of this 162.220 something, I'll go ahead and refresh and I get 208.54. whatever. It's, it's, that's the one assigned to me from my ISP, in this case, T-Mobile. So that right there in a nutshell is the basics of getting started with SSH Tunnel. It does require root, but it is epic in that it just works. I love this. There's other ways to do this with, say, ConnectBot and ProxyDroid, but I find this the simplest way to go. Highly recommend it. I know I will be using it on the road when I'm hacking across Europe, and I'm looking forward to hearing your guys' feedback. So hit us up, feedback at hack5.org. With that, we're going to take a quick break, but first let's check in with Patrick and see what's going on on TechThing. Patrick Norton here. I have the pleasure of hosting Shannon's other show, Tech Thing. We got some cool stuff coming up for you. This time, I swear, the drone roundup. Shannon's going to show you how to use hardware for two factor authentication and LastPass and why this may be the entire PC toolkit you need. Go check it out, people. TechThing.com or YouTube.com slash C slash Tech Thing. Thanks. That just about wraps up this week's episode of Hack 5. But before we get going, a couple of quick announcements. You are really toaster happy over there. My toaster. Well, yes. You can't have my toaster. Well, what if we, t what if we made it fly? Huh? Then maybe. Then maybe. Are we going to make this into a drone? I don't know. I think that would be fun. Anyway, uh, let us know what you think. The show, <laughs> feedback at hack5.org, what you'd like to toaster. see. And, of course, you can follow us, hack5.org slash follow, to find all of the links. Uh, and, of course, you can support us directly at hakshop.com. That's where you can, you know, get yourself some cool That's hacker right. gear. We've got land taps and Wi-Fi pineapples and USB rubber ducks. There's all sorts of goody James Bond stuff. It's fun. Things. Yes. Super fun things. Yes. Also, tune in to, um, to Tech Thing. My show. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's it's a good on show. Thursdays, hack5.org and techthing.com. Good stuff. Um, I should also point out to anybody in the greater European Union area that uh, Hack Across Europe is starting on February 8th. We're going to be going, I think, the 8th so through the 28th, oh something like that. 
And so if you haven't already signed up, if you're in the area, if you're at a hackerspace, if you want to show us around a hackerspace, or if you just want to come out to one of the various meetups, I do know that we're going to be doing Munich, Berlin, probably Amsterdam, uh, probably London, most definitely Dublin. Um, and uh, who knows, you know, it could be your hackerspace. Just sign up at hackacrosseurope.com and uh, stay tuned to the video blogs and all sorts of fun stuff for things on the way because I'm bringing some fun drones to the Europe. Oh, really? Mm-hmm. Mm. Mm -hmm. That sounds fun. Yes. Don't get stuck at the airport. No. Don't <laughs> fly drones in the airport. That's within five nautical miles. Oh my gosh. Technically. That's bad. Yeah. <laughs> Except for the, oh, I can't wait to show you the little, never mind. I don't want to spoil anything, but there's a micro micro. Oh gosh. It's like a nano micro. Tangent. Yes, Tangent. tangents. Uh, you can find the rest of the tangents at hack5.org. And with that, I'm Darren Kitchen. I'm Shannon Morse. Trust your techno lust. Bye-bye. Today on Hack 5, we have Arduino Cylons, SSH tunneling on Android, and Linux video editing coming up now. That was terrible, <laughs> I know, that was bad. <laughs> have you heard my dolphin noise? No. What? No. Favorite And it got recommended to me on Amazon like a couple weeks ago, and I was like, I was like, go home, Amazon, you're drunk. <laughs>